So good afternoon, everybody. I want to start off today with a few announcements about steps we're taking to enhance our healthcare system's capacity, help small businesses adapt childcare operations, and support unemployment benefits. DPH Commissioner Monica Burrell has signed two public health orders that have been issued today. The first order relaxes administrative requirements so that physician assistants, or PAs, who previously worked on elective surgeries can now work on other health care demands, including COVID-19. The second order, due to the expected demands on nursing staff, allows pharmacists to administer certain medication for the treatment of opioid use disorder instead of requiring a nurse to do so. Today we're also announcing measures for administrative tax relief for local small businesses impacted by COVID-19, especially in the restaurant and hospitality sectors. This process was designed in consultation with our partners in the legislature, and we want to thank them for that. For small businesses defined as those who paid less than $150,000 in 2019 sales and meals or room occupancy taxes, we will be postponing the payment of their respective sales, meals, or room occupancy taxes. Taxes due for March, April, and May will instead be due on June 20th. We will also waive all penalties and interests that would otherwise apply. The Department of Revenue is currently drafting emergency regulations to put this relief in place, and we expect them to be finalized before Friday when the payment would be the first payment would be due. Regarding unemployment insurance, I just signed emergency legislation to allow new claims to be paid more quickly by waiving the one-week waiting period for unemployment benefits. The Lieutenant Governor and I would like to express our thanks to the legislature for turning this legislation around quickly. This important change will ensure that we can get much needed unemployment assistance to workers who are impacted by COVID-19. Our administration is now ramping up operations to make sure that we can, can respond to the significant spike in unemployment claims. Our Labor Department's deploying additional employees to work on processing that large volume of claims. Although, as we have said before, if people can apply online, that is preferred. We've also created a new COVID-19 workforce webpage that includes the latest guidance for employee qualifications and additional information. That can be viewed at mass.gov slash unemployment slash COVID-19. With respect to childcare, effective March 23rd, all early education centers and family childcare providers will be closed. As a result, we have issued emergency procedures to set forth a process for opening exempt emergency child care programs. This will provide priority access for families of emergency personnel, medical staff, and others critical to fighting the COVID-19 outbreak. Volunteers, teachers, and staff from some child care programs have already reached out to the department to say that they are ready and willing to continue providing care which will be a relief to many of the parents who are working day and night to combat COVID-19. Families who work to maintain the health, safety, and welfare of all Commonwealth citizens will receive priority access to these emergency child care programs. Vulnerable children will also receive priority access. We'll work hard to make space for people who must go to work but aren't necessarily emergency personnel available as well. These emergency child care programs will be the only ones allowed to operate during this state of emergency, and EEC is working to ensure there is sufficient access to emergency child care programs in every region of the Commonwealth. Providers impacted by these closures will continue to receive child care subsidy payments from the state in order to ensure that the programs will be able to reopen once the crisis is over. Now, earlier today, I sent out an email to all executive branch employees to check in and to remind them that we are committed to getting the Commonwealth through this very difficult time. I want to share a little bit of what I wrote because I think much of it will resonate with people across our great state. The spread and effects of coronavirus has been sudden and stressful, but I believe the preparations, planning, and steps we're taking to mitigate the spread are the right things to do to deal with this public health crisis. I also recognize and appreciate that many of our decisions come with disruption, dismay, and disagreement. 
Change of this magnitude in such a short period of time is jarring under any scenario, and these changes come with financial and health risks on top of them. When people ask me why I've spent almost 20 years of my professional career either working or serving in a volunteer capacity in government, I always give them the same answer. Where else can you make something good happen for people or stop something bad from happening to people? That maxim has never been truer or more complicated to explain or understand. For the short term, our goal is to keep COVID-19 from spreading. That message gets interpreted in a variety of ways. Let's try this. 80% of the people who catch COVID-19 are going to feel like they have the flu. But it is very contagious. It is spread through droplets. It is not airborne. That's why we keep telling people to wash their hands regularly, use hand sanitizer, cough into their elbow, and maintain their distance. Now, for the other 20% of the people who catch COVID-19, it will be very serious. So the goal here is to limit the spread and the size of the spread so the disease itself doesn't overwhelm our healthcare system and hopefully reduce the number of people who are particularly at risk from getting it in the first place. We're going to do all we can to maintain social distance, wash our hands, do phone calls instead of meetings, and try to stay healthy. For me, that includes no longer visiting my 91-year-old dad in person, which I usually do almost every week. Stopping the spread, really separating the healthy among us from those who've caught COVID-19 is the single most important thing we can do. Today, thousands of public servants settled into a new routine, many of whom are working from home. Many more, however, are stepping up to this plate to ensure that state government in all its forms will continue to operate. We're doing everything we can to keep them safe while they carry out essential functions for the Commonwealth. I want to thank them for stepping up. Unemployment claims are being processed. Trains, buses, and commuter rail are running. Utilities are operating, and rules that protect individuals and families from dislocation have been issued. Small business assistance is being put into place. Our emergency operations centers are up and running. Phones are being answered. Driver's licenses are being issued and renewed. Public safety officials are on the job on our streets and in our neighborhoods. Service providers are being paid to care for those who need it most. And programs that feed and house the less fortunate among us are operating. Thousands of public servants are stepping up, and I know I speak for many of them when I say thank you for all that you do in the good times and the bad ones. There's much to do, but we're grateful for everybody's commitment to their fellow citizens. And we give everyone our word that we will devote everything we've got to defeating this. With that, I want to say thank you and turn it over to Secretary Suggs. Good afternoon, everyone. And as you know, today is the first day in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where non-essential elective surgeries are canceled. I just want to give you a couple of updates from uh, recent communications. As you remember, yesterday I indicated that all cities and towns in the Commonwealth have received communication regarding funding for our local boards of health. We intend to release up to $5 million by the end of this week. As soon as contracts come back, we are releasing funds. We have been aligning, aligning on all 351 cities and towns into regional entities to efficiently release funding to address costs already incurred and immediate needs going forward. These initial funding levels will be increased over time as needs continue to emerge and evolve at the local level. Some specifics. All large cities and existing health districts, which represent 49% of the Commonwealth's population, received contracts yesterday. Worcester, Lowell, and Berkshire County have had returned their signed contracts and funds have been released. As I reminded everybody, e-signatures is fine in a state of emergency. But we had only addressed 49% of the population. The towns that are not a big city or a health district are now joined into a COVID-19 crisis affiliation as of today. The affiliations are leveraging geographically strategic public health organizations to coordinate the needs and serve as the fiscal and communication conduit for these towns. As we speak, the affiliations are reaching out to the towns 
to determine their costs that they've already incurred and what resources they will need for the next seven to eight weeks. The affiliations are, some of them I mentioned yesterday, but they came together last night and this morning. The affili affiliations are the Massachusetts Health Officers Association, the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards, the Metropolitan Planning Council, and the Central Mass Regional Planning Commission, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. So they will provide the infrastructure for those cities, for those municipalities that do not have the infrastructure to provide local Board of Health support. 211. 211 is adding additional resources from both the state and United Way. We have received more than 6,100 calls about coronavirus since last Thursday, which seems like a long time ago when I say that was only March 12th. Folks are encouraged to use the callback feature. Your call will be prioritized in queue. You will not lose your spot in line. The 211 website also has resources available for general questions and have had over 11,000 visits since COVID-19 since last week. I want to talk a little bit about mental health. As a former commissioner of mental health and as someone where mental illness has affected my own family, we know that the outbreak of COVID-19 is creating anxiety and stress. Fear and anxiety about a disease can be overwhelming and cause strong emotions in both adults and children and our elders. Everyone reacts differently to stressful situations. If you or someone you care about is feeling overwhelmed with emotions like sadness, anxiety, stress, or feel like you want to harm yourself or others, call to talk, that's C-A-L-L-2, -L talk, is a resource available through 211. When you dial 211, hit four for English and then 25. It's important during this time to take care of yourself. Your friends and your family can help you cope with stress. Please support yourself and one another, and particularly the people you care about. Take breaks from watching, reading, or listening to news stories, including social media. Hearing about the pandemic repeatedly can be upsetting. It's important to take care of your body. Take deep breaths, stretch, meditate, or just do that. Try to eat healthy, well-balanced meals. Exercise or take a walk outside. Yes, you can take a walk outside. Get sleep and avoid alcohol and drugs. It's important to find time to unwind during stressful times. Try to do some other activities that you enjoy. Connect with others. Yes, we can connect with others. Talk with people you trust about your concerns and how you are feeling. It's a very important to reduce stress in yourself and others. Share the facts about COVID-19 and understand the actual risk to yourself and people you care about can make an outbreak less stressful. When we share accurate information, you can help people feel less stressed and it helps us connect with one another. As we all know, children and teens react in part in what they see from the adults around them. When parents and caregivers deal with COVID-19 as calmly and confidently as possible, they can provide support for their children. Parents can be more reassuring to others around them, especially children, if they feel better prepared. And with that, let me turn it over to our public health officer, Commissioner Monica Burrell. Good afternoon, everybody. As you all know by now, in Massachusetts, we have put in place important measures to slow the spread of COVID-19. Because this is a new and evolving disease, there's still many unknowns. We are here to help you understand what we know now, what is still unknown, and update you as the data and evidence evolves. I understand that this uncertainty can be stressful and confusing, but want you to know that we are working to inform you with the best and most updated information as we receive it. As we keep learning more, we will keep sharing information with you. 
today I want to take a minute to emphasize what social distancing is and to remind us why it's important to do this. COVID-19 is a contagious disease. That means the closer we are to each other physically, the more likely we are to infect somebody else. And this is what we're asking you to do to socially, to, for social distance. Stay six feet away from other people. Avoid shaking hands and hugging. Use technology tools such as online tools and social media to engage with friends and loved ones instead. Avoid non-essential travel and work from home whenever possible. You'll see that we have a graphic here today that displays some of these concepts and has reminders about what social distancing is. And we will be sharing this graphic widely, including on social media, with our partners at the local boards of health, and we'll be making it available through our website. We understand that keeping distance from people is difficult especially for young people who feel they are healthy and strong and don't feel this advice matters to them. But it does matter. People with mild symptoms can pass the virus on to others. So stay home as much as possible. As the secretary emphasized, it's okay to go outside, important to go outside, for exercise, for some fresh air, to take your dog for a walk, to go for a hike or to ride your bike, for example. You may also need to leave the house, of course, for medications or other essential resources. But when you return home, please remember to wash your hands, especially whenever you come in from the outside. If we ignore the guidelines on social distancing, we will be putting ourselves and everyone else at a much higher risk. Social distancing allows us time to maintain our healthcare system and preserve it for those who need it most. This is one of the most important times we are all called upon to help ourselves by helping others. We all have the power to take action. You have the ability to make a difference. You can truly impact how fast and how far this disease spreads in our community. Please do your part practice social distancing, and we will get through this together. Thank you.